All right, everyone, welcome back to the SW Podcast. Very excited today for an episode that, to be honest, we've been trying to do for a little while now, but, you know, between, well, you're recently graduated and then, you know, running it, both of us trying to, you know, cultivate our own YouTube channels. And then also on top of that, being graduate students, it is, uh, you know, we just finally got the time to do it. So it's uh, definitely a pleasure today to be joined by, well, now, Dr. Josiah Newton. Some some viewers might know him as that chemist on YouTube, and uh, we're it's it's just going to be a very fun episode today. I think today we'll talk about we'll hear a little bit about you know Joey's chemistry, um, or or to talk about maybe the inception of his YouTube channel, uh, and you know just honestly we don't really have anything prepared other than that today, so we'll see where the conversation goes. I, you know I'm really looking forward to it, um, but you know welcome Joey um, to the to the to the show. Um, I don't know if you want to introduce under yourself. the scope on your show. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll do, we'll do a little bit of an introduction. Um, not that perhaps, you, well, actually, I don't know, maybe a lot of the academics, maybe not, um, familiar with yourself, but also the YouTube channel at large. But, um, you know, you know, I know you, like I mentioned, you recently graduated from Simon Fraser university, which is. Um, on the western coast, I guess, of Canada, right yep. in British Columbia, right? I think right in um, Burnaby, British Columbia, at yep. the top of Burnaby Mountain. And presumably, you're from Western Canada, then. Um, yep. I would, yeah, I'm British Columbia, born and raised, also. Yeah, there you go. I've, you know, yet really, I've yet to get out to the Pacific Northwest of the United States, but also, um, I really want to check out that British Columbia slash Vancouver area. Um, I actually have one, actually, one of my group members. Her family is located in Vancouver, so she spent her vacation time there, and she says oh, very really? fantastic about Vancouver. Yeah, there's um, a reason I haven't moved away yet. It's, I'm sure, you know, I feel like people people forget about Vancouver because at least, and I'm, I'm, maybe the maybe this is a bit, I'm a little bit of a bias because I'm from Philadelphia, and so I'm very familiar with Montreal and Toronto, um, but Western Canada. I think it's, it might be just an Eastern thing, though. But I feel like Vancouver and isn't really talked about as much as the one of the, the goaded Can Canadian cities, you know? <laughs> it, it's it's all right. There isn't as much med chem and stuff going on, but there's like a bit of bio biotech startups in Vancouver. Um, yeah, in terms of like scenery, there's lots of nature. It's like a cultural melting pot of Canada, I would say. Um Mm. Yeah, there's a nice diversity of people, so you end up getting a really good culmination of ideas. It's just interdisciplinary conversations need to be happening as much as possible to really right. facilitate that. So fortunately, Vancouver uh, was able to instill that in me because that's like one of the most important things when you're creating anything is just having a lot of different voices, mostly because you get really interesting outcomes. It's like combining interesting reagents. You don't know right. what's going to happen unless you get like an oogie reaction, some multi-component uh, thing that starts happening. You do an you do an analysis of it. You've never heard of the oogie, but maybe you just happen to combine all the right ingredients, and bam, you have something that you don't expect. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, that's definitely well said. Yeah. Now that you think about it, you know, Vancouver Western Coast. I'm sure it has a very large Asian population that you know that yes. come over. I, I, I presume, um, you know, right over the the Pacific. So, um, and you know, it's not too far. I. It's not too far, well, relatively not too far from San Francisco, which is, you know, huge in tech. Yep. So I, I, it makes oh, sense totally. to me why it's a, a cultural and, you know, generally speaking too, a lot of fantastic um, chemistry going on. I know, uh, I know at, at least at UB, UBC is huge now um, for, for chemistry. Totally. I, I believe Karina Schindler is just moving there now at UBC, oh, I believe. Not, not familiar with her work. Um. I think she's I did spend one summer of undergrad research with Glenn Samus there, and okay. that was where I got some of my best uh, chemistry mentorship from. Oh, yeah, there you go. Well, you know, yeah, he's a great but, supervisor. Well, you know, I think that's a good place to start. Then um, we'll we'll start about with your background. Um, sure. Like you said, you said you were kind of born and raised in that area, but I'd love to hear more about you know if chemistry in general was always something you were really passionate about in that kind of broader context, and maybe you're general experience as an undergrad with chemistry and you know why you kind of fell in love with it so it's probably a similar story to what most chemistry majors uh in undergrad would say i had a good chemistry teacher in high school 
And Fair. he was like very charismatic and a good orator. And it was just the only outlier subject that was interesting to me that was like consistently interesting. It wasn't that it was like easy or hard. Like it was hard, but that's because you don't know why you're doing anything. I felt like in <laughs> high school, there's like zero context. Um, I felt like in undergrad, so there was true. barely any context. And after finishing my PhD, I now have the opinion, if you can't explain your research to someone who's not a chemist, it might actually not make sense. And mm. I would challenge anyone that can't explain their research to their family to take that as like maybe a sign to like really think about if what you're doing makes sense. Just just throwing that out there. I think so, I actually I can I want to return to that point maybe later on the podcast because I definitely have a I definitely want to get your opinion on the chemistry media landscape. Yeah. And how it's covered. I def I'm going to return to that point, though. We can put a pin um, in it. Sure. Yeah, we'll put a pin so, in it and come back to that. So my undergrad research experience uh, happened with Chad Friesen. I was working on this project to synthesize aryl containing hydrofluoroethers, some benzene ring, some amount of CF2s, and then an OCH3. And the goal in his lab was to produce these quaternary ammonium perfluoroalkoxides. So if you take something like dimethyl ether, that isn't going to react with most nucleophiles to produce methoxide. But if you take trifluoromethyl methyl ether, that will actually react with tertiary amines and other nucleophiles to produce trifluoromethoxide. So that's hmm. interesting. Trifluoromethyl methyl ether is a methylating agent. So there was a series of different hydrofluoroethers that were being explored in his lab. And I was trying to produce some novel derivatives that might still engage in this. Turns out those things are very hard to make using contemporary methodology. They're even harder to make uh, if your lab doesn't have the expertise in synthetic chemistry necessary to pull off such a feat. Um, but nonetheless, it got my foot into the door doing research. Afterwards, I went and I did some research in Glenn Samus's lab. I had some fluorine chemistry experience. Glenn Samus was doing some work with xenon difluoride, select fluor, NFSI at the time. Mm. And I happened to be interested in fluorine chemistry. And there's only like one other fluorine chemist. Um, so I sent him an email. He was like a really great guy to work for, really cared about my financial well-being, just being able to like be on top of projects, all, all of the things you need in a mentor. Um, mm. But there's always friction with certain people. So I had friction with some grad students there. But the, the irony is like his best grad student was someone I didn't get along with. And I could see simultaneously. It's just some personalities don't get along. So I ended up deciding to not pursue my graduate studies there, even though I had initially applied. Um, but I decided to work with Rob Britton at SFU, where he was also doing doing some fluorine chemistry. Now, doing some work that was derivative of some of the Glenn Samus's group's work, they were taking NFSI and tetrabutyl ammonium decatungstate, doing CH abstraction chemistry to generate carbon-centered radicals. Mm -hmm. And the carbon-centered radicals can react with NFSI, which is a really weak uh, NF bond donor. Instead of thinking about it as like, forming a fluorine radical you just view the carbon radical as a nucleophilic radical that's attacking an electrophilic fluorine center which then produces as a byproduct this nitrogen centered radical which the decatongue state can reduce back to an amide anion n minus uh, right. i don't normally get to do this on my channel so i'm very happy to be able to finally like talk chemistry and if you need figures for any of this we could we could talk about it after yeah i mean if you have um, figures I'm, I'm by all means like you could feel free to start sharing it's sure if you have some prepared i'm never never gonna I don't, I don't deny some figures right now but i could uh okay, okay. after we're done recording i could i could send you whatever like I've sure got, got yeah for all this i could send so Jason. so that's um, kind of the summary of what rob's work was doing and then mm -hmm. towards my thesis it was just uh, uh we can we can maybe get to that that was already a lot so yeah, yeah, sure. I was just, I was just gonna say, I, I uh, we just had a seminar. Where they were just talking about because I'm not really familiar with NFSI synthetically. I know from what I briefly know, it's, it's, I guess, an elect, extremely electrophilic fluorine source. It's a it? poorly electrophilic fluorine source, but if you have a really good nucleophile, you mm -hmm. can still react with it. Um, okay. There are better electrophilic derivatives which you can prepare from NFSI that are like. N aryl, N sulfonyl still, but like one sulfonyl group or one amide group, there's a series of people who've prepared a series of reagents um, in, right. in their own research groups. Some are better for radical fluorinations, some are better for uh, electrophilic fluorinations. 
But if you're looking for a really strong electrophilic fluorine source, you'd be better off with like n fluoropyridinium or um, select fluor, for instance. Mm -hmm. Now, for some for some viewers who aren't really familiar with like let's say fluorination strategies, because why? Because sure. let's, let's even just start there. Like, why why do people care about fluorination chemistry? Let's sure. just go there because you're very big into that. You're very familiar with this field, so. You know, why do people care? Sure. <laughs> so oftentimes people want to install fluorines for medicinal chemistry purposes. If you have a fluorine on a molecule, it can increase the lipophilicity of the molecule. It can modulate polarity. Oftentimes people will say that it can be made less polar, but there's some instances where you can polarize bonds as well. It really depends on the context the fluorine is in. Other times, if you're in a drug, drug discovery program, or if you're like uh, optimizing a lead compound, for screening purposes, uh, you might want to add a fluorine for metabolic purposes. So you might want to yeah. put a fluorine there to prevent metabolism from occurring. Um, or just, you know, you want to see what happens. Sometimes you get a gut feeling and it's like, well, what would happen if we put a fluorine here? And you just need to see. Um, so those are some potential examples. You might also want to install fluorines in the form of radiofluorine, fluorine 18, like uh, Varani Governor's work and some work in the Britain group utilizing 18F. Uh, strategies. So the reason why you'd want to use fluorine 18 is for PET imaging, which is positron emission tomography. Uh, it literally uses uh, a positron emitting nucleus, fluorine 18. A positron is antimatter that annihilates with uh, with an electron, produces so cool. two gamma rays, and you can detect it. It's like the coolest thing ever, right? And almost no one talks about it. It's like, yeah, right. this is literally using antimatter. And so if we can put this fluorine on a molecule somewhere, it can release antimatter and it can image a tumor in the body for us because those two electrons, uh, sorry, the two photons, the gamma rays that are emitted, they're approximately 180 degrees apart. They correct for that. And depending on how close it is to one detector and the other coincident detector, you can see where in the body it's coming from and computers just figure out all this. That's so cool. So, so cool. Yeah. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure that like it, it, the irony, I guess some of the irony is the technique's so cool, but I'm sure this is not easy to do. It's not like... Actually, right. I don't know. Is it simple? Is it simple to do radio labeling? So, I, guess, I suppose it depends. But So it should be, but it isn't. So one of the problems is if you make 18F F2, uh, fluorine gas is oh, already God. hard to work with. <laughs> well, you want to make fluorine reactive. Uh, one of the things the governor group wants to do is take like calcium fluoride fluorite and use that nucleophilically. And they have in some stuff and they are doing some potentially valid labeling strategies. The problem is you really want like silver or something to like give it a big oomph something to make the fluoride more naked and something to make mm. whatever reactions you're doing more facile so 18f f2 to extract it out of the cyclotron which they have to have a special target they use oxygen 18 o2 they bombard that with protons it turns it into 18f f2 replaces one of the neutrons with a proton um, or vice i think yeah i think that's correct uh, and then that will then uh, have to get extracted from the cyclotron. And because the fluorine's like sticking to all the surfaces, they extract it with 19F F2. Mm. <laughs> like they use it as a solvent to extract it out. Yeah. <laughs> so what they end up with is like Jesus. just a tiny, tiny little bit 18F F2 in the 19F F2. Yeah. And so at that point, like you're doing competition between 19F and 18F2 studies. Like you're not getting all of that as 18F. Mm -hmm. so that's the well, challenge with that maybe maybe i guess more over to how you know working with these fluorination reagents how difficult is it at yeah, the bench top like on the day-to-day -day? like i i don't know how general of a question this is i don't know how easy it is to answer because well i've always hear like i always hear about using f2 but i'm not going to sit here and pretend like i actually know the dangers of it like i i, I know you can make hf and it's kind of, I think it's the main danger of it. And that's very volatile. Um, you don't want to be breathing that stuff in, but that's I'm not really, them, yeah. I'm not really, so but I'm not going to say like, pretend. Yeah. I'd say it's sort of like, uh, like 10% fluorine is compared to like, I think like 50% fluorine, uh, chlorine or something like that. Mm. But basically the hazards are very exothermic reactions that really rapidly generate HF. Mm. Um, sometimes Gen you can have, like, it really depends on what the, what the situation is. The, right. there's just a lot of like legal and uh distribution chain issues to get it more than anything like if you want to get praxair or lindy or whatever your gas distributor is air liquid uh distributing fluorine to you they're probably not going to unless you have all of these specific safety protocols in place 
And mm. that has, at least in Canada, resulted in very few people being able to use fluorine in their work. And if you don't do that, you have to make your own fluorine. And so how do you do that? Well, you electrolyze HF. So that's a, a probably not something your lab should be doing and it's almost like why is this so hard maybe this is so hard for a reason right like you know yeah um and if you're a grad student like say no <laughs> just say no We're, yeah you can say no like that's within your rights to say no within and, uh, within your experience though, so have like what's we, our lab didn't what's have been the it, most dangerous um, you've used like i don't even know like what would what's been hf pyridine probably i worked with xenon difluoride when i was in the samus lab Okay. Um, what, xenon what's fluoride is dangerous because xenon can form like xenon esters or xenon carboxylates. So if you take xenon, xenon difluoride, uh, xenon difluoride can react with one or two carboxylic acids. It mm -hmm. makes HF, and then you get a xenon carboxylate. And if those dry out, they decompose and explode into like xenon, CO2, and whatever the carbon radical is. Um, Jesus. Yeah, I know, right? Like, yeah. But there's things that. Um, when I worked in uh, Chad Friesen's lab, they, for instance, worked with like HFPO, hexafluoropropylene oxide. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a case where that was just like leaking into the lab and nobody knew. And oh, uh, we were told it was non-toxic. So there's a lot of PFAS related things in that lab that yeah, <coughs> even those. Uh, oh, actually, I worked with quaternary ammonium perfluoroalkoxides. They're like both nerve agents. And then they hydrolyze to release HF and FOS gene or acyl fluorides that are PFAS. <laughs> like everything about it was bad. Jesus. Uh, so what are in the day to day then like what's the what is how do you work with this stuff then? I mean I assume like Schlenkline techniques, like how do you even like what are the alkoxides? Uh so those ones are water sensitive. So those would be worked with usually in a glove box, but they can be worked with uh on a schlank line. Mm -hmm. But I'm a chemist, you know, chemists are lazy. Chemists don't want to work <laughs> on schlank lines if possible. That's so fair. I would really push yeah. the, I would really push the limits. Like I tested some solution stability for some of the alkoxides and they'd be stable in acetonide trial for like a month or two. Mm -hmm. Um but most of the time we're just trying to get papers out because like an academic research lab is a paper machine more than anything yeah. else fundamentally. Yeah, I, I I hear that. Um yeah, at least that, that definitely can be the case um in in academia. Uh so Okay, so you're you're doing well a lot of fluorine chemistry both in your undergrad and graduate school experience. Yeah, I kind of want to let's 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 dive into um, your graduate school experience, your sure. kind of research there. Um, you know, take us through you know what you did uh, through your thesis. Which, by the way, for the viewers, you've already made a video on your thesis defense. It's on YouTube, so if you really kind of really want to get into the nitty gritty details of it. It is available online. We'll link that in the description for people to go see. But uh, if we want, I'll let you take the floor here and explain sure. it. So, because the research group, the Britain group, was working on NFSI derivatives, hmm. um, they were looking at heterobenzylic, like pyridine benzylic, which they would call pyridylic um, fluorination. But they were also looking at adding SCF3 groups there. So, there's an analog of NFSI, which is NN dibenzene sulfonamid there's just two mm -hmm. benzene sulfonyls connected to a nitrogen and then a fluorine coming off instead of the fluorine you could have an scf3 and we were testing to see if that would work with the group's chemistry as well and it turns out that it does but that's not a reagent that you could buy at that point in time now you can buy it from ambied which is hilarious um, <laughs> i was even able to buy silver scf3 and ship it to uh, a fedex store and like i had to make just casually of silver scf3 well yeah exactly right like <laughs> you can just get a whole bunch of silver salts for dirt cheap now and it's no longer ligma baldrich uh ripping <laughs> everyone off as it were um <laughs> but to make this stuff it was a pain right you have to take uh, carbon disulfide treat it with silver fluoride three equivalents four equivalents in excess you get silver scf3 you have to like filter this terrible mud through sea light and you have to do it several times and it's like super painful but then once you get silver scf3 this is done um it when the sulfur uh is reacted it forms silver sulfide and this is desulfur to fluorination and this is like foreshadowing for like what my whole thesis would uh, flourish into mm. um what uh, what I had to do, though, was uh, make this NSCF3 reagent. It was the main reagent that they were using for this paper, uh, along with like some difluorination and some other stuff we were looking at. Um, I made some other reagents, and uh, one day I decided to uh, mention to this undergrad I was supervising 
uh, hey, you should try taking this uh, silver fluoride and react that with TMS CF3, which is Rupert Prakash reagent. It's a nucleophilic CF3 source. Mm -hmm. um, and try reacting that with a thionoester. But just as like a control, try reacting silver fluoride with a thionoester as well, because maybe this will do desulfurative fluorination. Well, our other reaction, the random nucleophilic SCF3 thing made a big, or a uh, nucleophilic CF3 thing, did a whole bunch of side reactions, like whatever. But the proof of concept control did work, and we got a benzene CF2OCH3 as a consequence. Mm -hmm. And so this is how we figured out that thionoesters react with silver fluoride, desulfurative fluorination. So from that point on, uh, we went and explored a wide range of different thionoesters, demonstrating that we could, under like room temperature or occasionally 80 degrees in acetonitrile, react silver fluoride with a, with a thiocarbonyl and put a CF2 there. And uh, this was similar to some work that the Schoenbeck group was doing to put um, NCF3s from thiocarbamoyl fluorides and some other nitrogen contexts like uh, trifluoromethyl hydrazines, et cetera, et cetera. So I was looking at the oxygen series while their group in Germany was looking in the uh, like nitrogen series. We weren't mm. collaborating, but we were, we were occupying different but similar niches. So after that, uh, we expanded this to make difluorobenzodioxals, which are present in some drugs such as Lumicaptor, Tezacaptor. And uh, finally, we developed uh, a surrogate for a thiocarbonyl, which is called a benzene dithiol. And you can tune the redox properties of this ring to be faster or slower so mm -hmm. that you can have a faster reaction. If this is applicable for 19F uh, silver fluoride, then it could also be applicable for 18F silver fluoride. And so we were able to do some carrier added experiments where a little bit of 18F2 is spiced into a reaction done at Triumph with our collaborators, uh, Paul Schaefer, the Schaefer group. Um, they were able to show that the 18F would get incorporated into these molecules. And that was of interest because, hey, now we can start doing potentially PET imaging with this. Mm -hmm. And so the majority of this work was aimed towards putting 18F installation in a mild late stage fashion. And that was what our collaborators were able to demonstrate. Right. So I just did the cold chemistry. Yes. Just on that, though, because I'm very, I'm not really familiar with uh, like desulfurization. Um, but it kind of got me thinking, you know, what's is what's the difference then, or like what's or why not? Could you not do like deoxygenation? You know, why do you have to have thionoesters? Sure. Like, I'm not like I don't know if you could take us through that sure. a little bit. I'd love to. Um, so a thiocarbonyl is a sulfur. It's a relatively neutral functional group. It's a very mm. soft Lewis base. And silver one is a soft Lewis acid. So they're going to have good orbital overlap. And fluoride is a hard uh, anion, right? So what you're doing is you're taking the sulfur and you're taking the silver and you're saying like, make it kiss mm. and it weakens it. And so the fluoride can attack. But then the second silver, a second silver can come along and eliminate that as silver sulfide. And it goes via an oxocarbenium. So we have a mm. fluorine containing oxocarbenium generated just via the soft Lewis base interaction of the silver and the sulfur. And uh, we're able to generate carbocations at room temperature using this, which is crazy, right? Mm. Now, the problem is if you wanted to do this with a carbonyl, you might be able to do it with uh, sulfur tetrafluoride or DAST. Uh, diethylamino sulfur trifluoride but those are sketchy really toxic reagents and they also react with water to make hf and they can explode um, mm. and sf4 is a gas as well which is also not great but industrially Jesus. they would absolutely screen these because why not yeah um, if you're just trying to make like a bulk building block they'll find a way to do it with sf4 in, in all likelihood um sometimes you can react like carboxylic acids with uh dast or deoxafluor to make Carb carbonyl fluorides or acyl fluorides you can sometimes make trifluoromethyl groups and uh it's known that dast will react with ketones aldehydes to make cf2 groups as well but they have a accompanying side reactions that are often undesired like uh, alpha elimination so you'll get vinyl fluorides for instance okay so you can just different reagents i see just a, yeah so yeah that is a that is um perhaps uh for you know yeah, using silver. Actually, I didn't know silver was a um, soft Lewis acid. Yes, yeah, I didn't know it was a soft Lewis acid. Um, but I guess I, I guess that actually kind of makes sense now. I'm not not really that familiar with the uh, those uh, hard soft coin, Lewis acid coinage theory. Well, 
Well, not that, but the 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 coinage metals. I'm not really I'm not really familiar with because I, I, at least I, well actually I guess that makes sense. I know gold is extremely soft with acid, yeah. so gold I suppose is it actually also makes super sense. duper soft. Um, um, copper one is just hard because copper one fluoride is only stable when there's certain ligands available. So like yeah, you could have triphenylphosphine stabilize a copper one species. I mean, you'd probably know more about transition metal chemistry than I would. Uh, I I only learned what I needed to about silver and whatever other metals i tested yeah to be fair and, and to be fair honestly you can really explain a lot of everything with hard soft acid base theory um you honestly you really can <laughs> you explain a lot of stuff with that uh so that that makes that makes sense um but yeah so maybe it's um i don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about maybe like what the the day-to-day kind of looked like um and maybe maybe yeah. and actually a question i always love um asking people is what were what were some things you did day to day that like made you a more efficient chemist like were there are there little, little yes, hacks there are that, there are that, so many that yeah maybe we, we can we can talk about them because I, I i always love hearing about how how one could be a more efficient um sure so i day. was a methods chemist so i was screening a lot of reactions and a lot of substrates yep um, you need to be efficient then <laughs> Yeah, well, like, yes and no. Or like, thoughtful. My, my priorities were wrong, uh, but I didn't realize it at the time. Like, I was playing the academia game, um, and, you know, the likelihood that I would predict a, a reaction that would have a successful outcome was maybe, like, 30-40%. But if I'm doing chemistry now on my own, working on projects that I think are important, and just doing it off the cuff based on experience, my success rates are way higher, like 80% plus, even if it's, like, a novel substrate. It's just about, like, having meaningful priorities i guess yeah Um, no i hear that yeah but running the research lab so like when i was um when i was supervising undergrads for instance every morning i'd be the first one in the lab i would make sure that all of the glassware in the lab was clean this is both when i was an undergrad supervising other undergrads but then also as a grad student and then i would make sure that all of the glassware in the cabinet was always clean um i was working in some partner lab for some of my phd work so this is more applicable there Mm -hmm. and i would make sure that every piece of glassware in all of those cabinets had been based bath and that meant like a couple weeks maybe even three weeks of every day washing everything and you know what you can tell by texture if something's been based bath yes you can gloves and handling it you can totally tell yep um and that gave me trust in all the glassware and sure it meant that i had to clean it but it wasn't like a burden because it was like control it was like a good piece of control um Mm. i would turn the rotovap bath on so that it was at the right temperature i would turn the chiller on and then after i'd done that and gone through washing the base bath glassware for like half an hour to an hour everything would be ready to go i'd have music playing in the lab you know the types of things that would try to make it a place that people wanted to to be around right um one good thing i picked up from the samus group was spotify um i had not used spotify before then but it was like it is and was the like objectively superior platform for music and you can have group music Preach. that where people can like add their own songs and stuff. So uh, if you're not using Spotify, you should. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable now. People use Apple Music, bro. Listen, yeah, let agree. me know in the comments. I say it's a let me know in the comments. You can come <laughs> after me all you want, but I'm telling you right now, Spotify is the superior platform for all this stuff. You can make the sessions. People can add stuff to the queue. It's it's, it's yeah. Great. I love jams, jam sessions where you can add yeah. stuff to a queue. When I found out about that, I was like, this is the best because yeah. it teaches your algorithm. Like you're training an algorithm based on other people's preferences. Mm-hmm. and then you can select for music that your friends like and you like which tends to be better music and then the algorithm gets trained as well so it's a give and a take and you know you're doing yes. a deal with the devil as it were but it's a good deal <laughs> but anyway so you're kind of in lab uh and and i i, I it's it's kind of thankless at times but yeah having like clean glassware is extremely important and just like the appearance of the lab is just better for morale right? Yeah, like it just it goes such a long way, and it's it is kind of thankless too, which is unfortunate. Uh, I don't know, maybe maybe you do have. They did. They, they, there was gratitude, but they, in uh, in my grad student hear lab around other grad students, no, they like they were not like that. That's unfortunate. <laughs> they That's were unfortunate. The opposite. That's I'm yeah. sorry to well, hear you that. You reap what you sow, right? Like you reap yeah. what you sow. Yeah, I hear that. Um, but yeah, so yes, yeah, especially because you're kind of a, a methods person too, you know. Were there some other things besides cleaning the glassware that was like really kind of made you efficient? Like I don't know. Yes. Little tidbits here. So, 
So like one is if you want to have a lot of experiments that succeed, you need to do a lot of experiments. That's mm. the first rule. Like yeah. you need you need to have a lot of experiments running to have outliers. Um, you know, and you don't want the outliers to get rid of them. You want to notice what they are. When I noticed a weird unexpected peak in my GCMS spectra, I would figure out what that mass was, even if it wasn't what I was expecting. Um, I would look. When I had a good idea with a that was relevant to like just a professor that wrote a paper, like their lab has all the expertise. I'm not going to hide this idea away from myself. I'm going to give it to them because yeah. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to wait 10 years and then be like, oh, I held on to my idea. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to give this away now because right. at least maybe the idea comes to fruition. And I got a co-authorship on a paper for doing that. And it wasn't oh, wow. even like I expected that. Um, I just was like, hey, you did it with SF4 or SF5CL. What if you did it with SF4CF3CL? Because mm. I was familiar with this like SF4CF3 group, which is like, oh, maybe it's a new medicinal chemistry thing. But right. I was just like, oh, this would be a really easy paper for that guy to do. And he's like, oh, dude, um, like, thank you for that idea. If it works out, I'll like make you, I'll like contribute you to the paper. There you and, go. Uh, then out of nowhere, like a year and a half later, after YouTube started, or yeah, after YouTube started, he was just like, bam, here you go, authorship. I was like, what? That's yeah, awesome. it goes a long way when you, you know, it's it's surprising Probably. as surprising as this is when you are not gatekeeping information you you get a lot of you make collaboration yeah you make collaborations and you know you um are able to push the field of science um which is who knew who knew who knew that would that would that would happen you know um, we just need more beyond uh we need more beyond chemistry to chemistry collaboration and more like biology to chemistry collaboration outside of medchem mm -hmm. <laughs> just like sheer researcher to researcher and even people to researchers right um so other other life hacks so just have good solutions to make things faster if you're going to do something a thousand times make sure it's fast um so just like not getting into ruts or not getting into like muscle memory habits all the time mm. um making sure that you're not fighting for like a, a spot on the schlank line making sure that there's enough schlank lines like a lot of this comes down to like team management skills. Yeah. So like if the team isn't running well, you won't be running well either. Like it's kind of like uh science is a group sport. So if anyone's like doing poorly, we all are. Yeah. Um, that is true. Yeah. Uh, reading papers, looking at like there was an app that I don't know if it's still working because the ACS and uh, Elsevier and related publishers, they just do kind of whatever they want, whether or not it's for the good of their users. And no one can uh, stop I would them. Follow acs to go um that was an app that i used when i was an undergrad and it would just be like a way to see new papers that come out and a way to just filter it in a way that's not as laborious as an rss feed like i just mm. want to install an app i just want to see papers i don't care about anything except for the toc graphics initially if the toc graphics are good just like good filtering mechanisms to get good information right um great that i uh quick 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 side note because I do have, I personally have an RSS feed that works for me. Yeah, um, everybody has their own. Thing. Right. Uh, just a quick side note: Angavantic Chemi International. Why? Why aren't your abstracts have pictures on it when I go through my RSS feed? I don't know if it's an RSS feed issue or that's an Angavante thing, but I'm, let me know. <laughs> um, yeah, either way, like I need make that. your make your stuff like if you want to reach people, make sure that it reaches people. Like, look at your users and how they're using your journal and then just like literally use your eyes and see what the problems are right? right like i don't know how they get so tone deaf to a lot of these things but like yeah it's there's a it. reason why i'm doing important papers i know it's been a couple months since we posted but i was just gonna say on it still. i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna put a pin in that too because i definitely because that kind of is more over your your youtube channel in general um but i guess one other question i have then is before we, we transition to your youtube channel is uh what's kind of your um process for reading papers like what's kind of um what do you and this kind of changes you know this kind of changes over time like what you're looking for yes, out of a paper it's different it's but, different now than it was before but your but process when i was in a general, grad student yeah if if i can understand the toc graphic like it has to be like to understand anything it has to be in relation to something so like if i'm reading a paper it's probably because i think it's somewhat related to my research Mm -hmm. um in some way because you have to start somewhere or if, if i think it's neat like if the toc graphic looks cool i might go like oh wow no way 
I remember when I was an undergrad, it was like, what the heck, another like uh, gallium triflate paper? It's like forever, whatever reason, scandium triflate, gallium triflate. They were like, everybody's using these as Lewis acids for everything. And it's like, oh my gosh, we do not need another hundred scandium triflate papers. Just like do something it, interesting and useful. It, and I right. even got that meme when I was an undergrad because it was yeah. like, dude. Yeah. Well, I, so I, I uh, just on that, I just there's a lot of papers too that are like, Oh, we use catalytic amounts of scandium and gallium to do this reaction, but it's like three or four equivalents. It's like that's not a catalyst. That's not a catalyst. That's, exactly. That's, but yeah. okay, that's off my high horse though. But <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so so first of all, like, is it a meme paper? Is if and I I say meme because it's like if it's a meme paper, like, oh boy, another benzylic CH activation or another like alpha to an ether, like, it's like. First of all, it's like I will like apply the whip of like, is this another one of the ones that I have problems with? Yes or no? Mm. Uh, and I might take a screenshot of it to send to someone to be like, look, they're still doing it, right? Yeah. Uh, or another uh, palladium free uh, met transition metal free cross coupling that's about to be retracted. It's like, hey. how did this get through review again? <laughs> I uh, and, uh, I was actually, I think I think one actually just got published. It was uh, no, don't tell me that. Wait, hang on. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this up now because I I think I flagged it because yes yeah, that's the kind of thing you should make a video on like aside from interviewing guests that would be super interesting to just tell that story because I haven't heard anyone tell that in a compelling way on YouTube yet the uh, on the transition metal free um, cross coupling yeah the biggest meme in chemistry is what I would title the video and then I... it's it's like transition metal free question mark metal free. Yeah, I uh, I I have to I have to find it. Uh, it's gonna bother me now. I, I it was on uh, I want to. I'll find it. I'll find it as we're talking. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of look for it. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess for people that aren't really familiar with what we're talking about, we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll just quick side sure. note real quick. So cross coupling has a long rich history of being catalyzed by transition metals, you know, namely palladium and nickel, I suppose. I won't go into it, but it, there there was papers that got retracted because they claimed to be Suzuki, or they, I think it was specifically Suzuki free. Usually, or I'm sorry, hang on, it was a transition metal free Suzuki coupling um, that was supposed to be transition metal free. But uh, long story short, you can you know, have part per million level, part per billion level of palladium, and that'll catalyze these reactions. Um, in fact, and famously, you can go to the side of the road, pick up like road dust, and use that to catalyze these reactions. So, um, because palladium particulates will fall off in the catalytic converters, and you can find that on the road. So, anyway, that's 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 the quick side note about that's about that. That's another good me. story, by the way. That that would yeah. be another great story for yeah. video. That would be um, another just one. Showing it and doing it, showing that it works. Like it doesn't matter if it's been published before. Okay. Yeah. For YouTube, it doesn't matter if it's been published. Just show people good chemistry. Like right. That's my attitude. So, um, so that would be my first process. Then I look at the TOC graphic and I go like, one, does the transformation look interesting? Two, does it look like it belongs in the journal that it's in? Like if it looks mm. like it's a JOC article, for whatever reason, JOC articles just are worse. Uh, <laughs> statistically, usually they oh, tend man. to be worse. How come? Um, like, what do you, how do you mean by worse? Well, if though? you compare to Orglet, like if you look okay. at oh, JOC and Orglet, like your time is better spent reading an Orglet. And if you go and you read like 100 JOC papers and 100 orglets, you're going to find out that that's true. And if you mm. look at Jack's articles, Jack's articles about uh, organic synthesis, and you do the same thing compared to like orglet or JOC, you're going to find that Jack's is an even better use of your time. And this mm. is the only, like you have to validate these things for yourself and you should. Like as a chemist, you should validate things for yourself and not take them based on assumptions. Right. Because like your sixth sense, your intuition is your skill. Um and you have to be skilled to be good as a chemist, like fundamentally. Right. So, uh, like, if I usually would still look at JOC, and I usually would still look at Orglet. Now I now I look at very few new papers because it's just not part of our workflow. For when we're doing important papers, we do. But I typically have my own filtering mechanisms that do quality control first, that are better yeah. than an RSS feed, that are better than ACS to go. Basically, someone such as yourself or another person will say like, hey, this is an awesome paper, and we'll post that in the important papers feed. 
Right. And that way, everybody can go there and look at good papers, not just the ones I cover, just what they think is good. Mm -hmm. And then that's like a better, like it's even easier than an RSS feed because then you're just having interesting ones that people select. And yeah. not a ton of people are using this compared to like an RSS feed, but they're probably getting a higher quality output. But it depends. Mm -hmm. It really depends on the type of work that you're doing. Yeah. So at that point, I would then start considering um, like, does this look like, again, I would double check, like, does this look like it belongs in the journal that it's in at a face value? Like, again, you can usually tell when something that gets into uh, Orglet probably belongs in JOC, just because, like, the type of transformation that occurs is like, eh, it's not that interesting, and they have some weird sulfur motif that I've never seen. Um, <laughs> I'm, I tend to be pretty much, like, I think palladium is, like, too much of a meme. Like, it's kind of like its own field of chemistry aside from cross couplings <laughs> i know i say that to you as a palladium chemist so i apologize yeah. no it's um, not good it's just like uh it does it's everything like someone talk it does like, everything it's like someone talking about their dreams it's right. like oh i had this dream where i could walk across a bridge it's like okay is it real uh like it was a dream but like with palladium it can be real and it could be useful for certain people screening certain reactions but i'm not someone screening palladium reactions so it was right. not like pertinent to me no i, I hear that. that it's kind of that yeah, I uh, yeah, for, for for yeah, definitely for the for the for the viewers, you know, if you have a, if whatever we say, you know, if you like the Journal of Organic Chemistry, by all means, you can go, you know, go ahead. I I never read that journal because it doesn't pertain to my research at all. Um, I do love me some organic letters. I love that. Yeah, they can be really good. I love that one. Um, just because I just love how by and large how succinct it is like it's like maybe six pages max if that um and whenever i read it so it's just it from what i my impression is that it's super or mostly useful synthetic transformations um i my impression of the journal of organic chemistry is it's pretty synthetically um niche i suppose you'd say uh yeah. like it's it, it had to and, go somewhere and it was better than a tetlet yeah but <laughs> fair yeah um and uh yeah so but on the yeah look on the at view on... counts like i would just say look at view counts for articles and they're going to tell you pretty well what's quality and what's not yeah um but, and by and by the way nothing you know i i, I feel like there we are had... diamonds in the rough right like yeah. there are diamonds in the rough for there sure. are diamonds in the rough but also this should not if you are like a if you are someone who's published in lower tier journals published like in joc i've published like, two papers in joc yeah this like, is this is nothing a reflection on people that do this work yeah at all. like your paper lands where it lands right yeah like like, yeah. like at the end of the day some arbitrary reviewers are going to make an arbitrary decision about what you're doing and are they your peers Pro maybe but like if they're like there's just not a good method to know if they were valid or not because of how the peer review system doesn't disclose anything mm -hmm. so it's like you have no idea if the review process is valid right, right. that's a pretty big issue with peer review mm -hmm. um it should be open peer review and the people who have the review like their comments should be made public and their name should be tied to it so that mm. they have skin in the game um and then if certain reviewers are always like a hard ass then you know that this reviewer is always a hard ass right and then you don't have to take people's words and it's no longer like whispers behind closed doors it's just like you know if if someone's an ass <laughs> let it be known and yeah. then suddenly they're gonna have to be there you know they're they're gonna have to put their money where their mouth is right right that is yeah that is so true that i wish was part of the academic cycle like why I, I, and I don't even really know how to fix it, honestly. It just it just is what it just is. Just upload you YouTube guys, videos. Upload YouTube fair. videos. Yep. You can earn money doing it, and it'll actually reach people through an algorithm that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I I hear that, and I think that's actually where we're returning to. So actually, yep. this is this is then a good transition then to. Well, we're bringing it there. It's it's not like uh, you don't have to wait for the tides to move. You just start moving them. Right. And that works with mm -hmm. algorithms. That works. Mm -hmm. So th this is a good transition then, I guess, right into the YouTube channel. Um, sure. Because, yeah, I mean, like, you know, like we, we had mentioned before, I mean, you, uh, I guess before we started chatting, but, you, I mean, your YouTube channel is like over 200,000 subscribers now. Like, that's oh, crazy. And it's, 
what's even crazier is I, I was just looking through. I mean, your oldest video is like not even two years old. So you've really made this platform that's extremely accessible and the content's really fun and engaging um, that shines like good Thanks. light on the chemistry. So I don't know if you want to take us tell us a little bit about maybe the inception of the, of the YouTube channel um, and also sure. its role maybe more broadly in the, the, the chemistry community, in your opinion. Sure. So there's two things that I had initially envisioned since I was like uh, a young grad student. I always liked tier list videos, but I wished somebody would do like chemistry tier lists. And that was just something I'd had like forever with me. But then when I started making videos, I was like, I have to be serious. I have to make things that are worth people's time. And mm. the way that organic chemistry is taught in universities is wrong because you get to grad school and you don't know how to do any of the transformations everyone's doing. Like you don't know what a mm. tempo babe oxidation is. You don't know what TPAP oxidations are, right? Like you've never used DMP. You've never seen Desmartin. Like, right. like this is problematic. So I'm going to do what I can to address this. The problem was the way that I was doing it at the time in the style that I was doing it wasn't compelling enough to reach enough people for it to be financially viable. Mm. I was able to get like uh, my first hundred, couple hundred subscribers this way. Um, and that was motivating enough for me to continue. And I did keep getting better. I did get feedback from other people. But the biggest thing was getting like lots of feedback from lots of people because everybody has a valid perspective on things. And that like accepting that took me a really long time to come around and see because I had heard some uh, mixed advice that was like, only accept advice from your viewers, don't accept advice from your non-viewers. But it's like getting the cart before the horse. It's like someone who isn't one of your viewers will tell you something that's blatantly obvious that you're missing. Like, mm. uh, I have no idea what he's talking about, where he came from, why he started doing this. And it's like, oh, I should have an explanation here. Um, don't talk in a boring voice. So I haven't been talking like this the entire time because this would be really hard for me to do, especially if I'm on camera. <laughs> And then I'm having to do this like weird eye contact thing. Um, but normally if I'm doing like voice acting for the channel, I would have that oomph because it's more compelling right. and it's easier to follow. Mm -hmm. But I, so, even, you go ahead, yeah. go ahead. So uh, that was the, those were the two things, the the chemistry tier list and the, and the like original series was introductory organic chemistry, which I still right. have on my old channel. But I needed to create a new channel for monetization reasons. Right, I hear that. Yeah, so I, uh, um, tier list, tier list, are, we're definitely in a tier list era. Everyone loves their tier list. Um, I don't know what it is. People just love. I I've watched <laughs> football Tetlet tier list. Go into F tier. J O C oh can go into C tier. Uh, <laughs> J O uh, Orglet can go into like B tier, but it's a high B. <laughs> Jax can go into like uh a tier or s tier and then science and nature can go into like b tier because a lot of the time i think that they're like over inflating their own importance i think i think it's a very youtube s tier uh, you 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 knew listen you do you, you're more into the hardcore organic chemistry than i am because i'm more transition metal stuff but yeah you don't you don't think you don't think given tetrahedron and f is kind of a bit rude no, it's no? deserved Where's really? the SI in a lot of those papers? Okay. Tetrahedron is worse than tetrahedron letters, but tetlets often don't have an SI. Like if there's no really? spectra for anything, they don't even have peak by peaks for a lot of them. Yeah. So like I, I never even read I don't think I've ever read a tetlet paper, honestly. Yeah. Or tetrahedron. You're better off. You're better off. <laughs> um, I have no idea. Um There's uh there's one of the mods in a lot of the chemistry um discords, Doyle. Uh, one of his like statuses that he used to have on his profile was applying tetrahedron letters papers directly to trash. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's exceptions. Okay. There are exceptions. Right. Uh, there have, there have been good ones, but it's like, it's better to find a diamond in the rough than it is to find like a diamond in an entire dump. <laughs> like make it easy for yourself. Read Jack's um, papers. Uh, that's, that's funny. Oh man. I, and yeah, the fact that we're even having like, uh, like uh, publishers tier list is also kind of ironic in a, in a, of itself. They've done it to but themselves. Yeah, the, I guess, I guess they, I guess so. Um, but uh, I well, definitely all uh, doing is filtering papers, right? And all I'm doing is filtering them. It's the right. same thing. That's fair. That's fair. And Except you know what? My name behind it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. You're putting your name behind it. You know, it's a dog eat dog world out there. You know. 
we're we're out here putting our opinions out there. People can come after us, you know, but that's just how we feel. Um, you disagree with me? Let me know. I have yeah. open DMs everywhere. There you go. It, the, the DM and DMs are also open for me as well. If you, if you like to share these opinions, you know, I'm, I'm happy to discuss these. I'm happy to discuss these, in, I, ironically and unironically too. Um, so, yeah. But but so you know we have the inception of the YouTube channel and now. You know, we. I, I kind of wanted oh, to ask you. I didn't you... even tell you the other. There's a bit more lore. So okay, let's hear. Please. please. Oh. So, uh, so I'm really good friends with a YouTuber named uh, I'm Kibitz. Okay. And I happened to meet him through a mutual friend. He was one of my really close friends during grad school, and I knew that this was doable. And once I realized how good the YouTube analytics were compared to the tools that we use in chemistry, like NMR, IR, which like you never use anymore. Uh, mass spec like hplc lcms like you can but like if you are what are you looking for like yeah. it, it's just but youtube analytics gives you way higher resolution data about everything and the more you understand your analytics and the more you understand where you can improve one percent the the easier it is to like get better at making videos and understanding human psychology so mm -hmm. like if you can't understand human psychology and you can't accept that the metrics of your channel are valid you can't improve um, but if you can accept that they're valid and you can look at them and learn something from them either like through your it's harder to do it all independently it's easier when you work with other creators that are a similar size to you and and higher size because like power leveling kind of like world of warcraft um, it is true then you, then you grow faster reading good books will help too now the thing is it's way easier to succeed at chemistry uh, on youtube or just YouTube in general, than it is mm -hmm. to succeed in chemistry in the lab. And that's true. because you have limited tools and and you're not relying on being stimulating and entertaining. You're relying on chemistry doing what you need to do. And so once I realized that, and I was like, oh, if I make stuff, I can own it. Uh, like there's just a lot of reasons that start adding up. Like I can be paid proportionally to the impact that I have. Um, mm. There's no one arbitrarily setting what my salary is. Um, right. I can own what I do. Like, I really want to highlight that cause as a methods chemist, you know, when I graduated, I lost 350 parts of me, like 350 compounds. Um, and that's mm. like of, of hundreds that I made that, that like some decomposed over time. And like those have potential value, right? But they won't, they won't get taken advantage of by the people who are there because uh, they don't maintain libraries of all the compounds that they make in their own lab, right? Like mm. it's just... There's missing utility that's just going right down the drain, and it's really tragic to see that. Right now, uh, yeah. So, but just just on the the because well, I want to kind of ask your opinion on the the chemistry media um, landscape in general because my impression is there's well, one, I think that there is a gap between the general knowledge of chemistry and then what's actually happening in the academic labs. Um, slash med chem slash oil and gas there's such a huge disconnection there oh totally um you're right. and and then and this is kind of where in part you know you're you're you know like our channels kind of can bridge that gap a bit they start I think. to they start start to, to. Um, and yeah i wanted to kind of just hear your thoughts on that in general the you know the the chemistry media platform and it's that landscape the siloization right like it, it's a problem for everyone everywhere it's not exclusive to chemistry but because we're chemists we see the chemistry ones where it's like you start in a lab you, you hear about med chem but i've never worked in a med chem lab i've never seen what process chemistry looks like right i've never seen cracking at a petrochemical facility um i want to see all that right i want to see all that um so I want to be able to go there and make videos about that. I want to have people comfortable reaching out to me saying like, hey, here's a cool opportunity. Um, kind of like Tom Scott does, right? I think Tom Scott did one on Triumph. And so Triumph mm. is at least open to it. So that's good. Um, Triumph is like the the local cyclotron in BC and Vancouver. It's at UBC. Oh, actually, it's a separate facility. Oh, that's really cool. Okay. So like, uh, I think what, what it will take is a few initial people seeing stuff like this. And there's like close opportunities where I almost got to see a gas facility in California where like they were making gas standards, but then that guy doxed his whole company. And so he kind of screwed himself over. Uh, Jesus. Yeah. Bad. They doxed were, like, his company? And stuff. Yeah. There's like oh. US Navy just posting waybills. It was bad. Anyway. Jesus. Um, 
what it will take is a couple people willing to take the risk to like bridge the gap. I think some of those other chemistry podcasts with experts like the Pfizer people, uh, I'm drawing a blank on the name uh, at the moment, but uh, you mean farm to table? You mean uh, Merck? Yeah, yeah, farm, farm to, to table. table. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, Merck. Elsie but... Campo. Yeah, so he yeah, collaborated with Danielle. Rob as well. Elsie's Elsie's a really smart guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anybody who's able to like articulate and bridge that gap, please make videos. <laughs> like, yeah. Like anybody in a position to bridge any of these gaps between disciplines, it's like we need you. We need you to make videos or we need you to help us make videos. Right. Um, because that's the only way that this gets better. But um, okay. what I want to ask you is do you ever get like because you are monetizing stuff, you, people call you like a sellout? Do you ever kind of get that or no? Never, is it? never okay. once. Never once. Um, and all of the people who are contributing to the productions are paid with the mm -hmm. exception of one person who – says if they get paid they will not work on it <laughs> like <laughs> because they're like one of the number one they are the number one fan and yeah uh, ballerine if you're out there thank you so much for your help there you go now so how about this i'm sure you get asked this a lot but i'm gonna ask it anyways um like ed, ed well not i, I want to say advice for you too but how like how did you make that the discord server and how did you kind of get how did you how were you able to kind of cultivate this chemistry community um, so a well, lot of things that all were working well sorry let ask me the second part of your question uh how you what i say how do you grow the the discord how community from yeah sure yeah so i knew about discord um i had been using it with some of my friends during covid to play jackbox games mm -hmm. and one of the things that i wanted to do was filter people from the youtube channel to a discord because I really liked talking on Discord with people, and I just wanted to have a community where I could talk to people. And the YouTube comments are not a community. It's sort of like one voice right. that's slightly cohesive. It's better than Reddit. Reddit is not a community <laughs> ever. Reddit is, Reddit is pandemonium. <laughs> but YouTube is like semi. Like there is, a, there is a culture that you're building, but you can't tell what it is till you put something that the that the community can engage with right and then certain people will do a really good job representing how a lot of people feel and those comments will get a lot of likes mm. but on discord you can dialogue and dialoguing is real conversation mm -hmm. so i wanted to have the ability for people to interact with me because one of my values throughout my life was like i think i should be able to talk to this creator i want to reach out to them um and there's a couple people who did respond so one time when i was younger i reached out to tom scott and he responded and i reached out to smarter every day and he responded um and the people who did that i had a lot of respect for because it was like oh you're awesome thank you um i sort of think about it like two cells in the body if one cell wants to send a signal to another cell who is that other cell to say like no i'm gonna be closed-minded mm. now that being said you do occasionally get somewhat crazy people but very 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 rarely even up to now um there was some days where i was going a little bit crazy like uh, just messaging people for four hours per day but i've just i've learned to set boundaries like four hours per day like day after day after day after day after day like that is all crazy, intense dude. It that was. is crazy i don't know anyone else who does that <laughs> like i'm the only one who i've found who does that <laughs> uh yes i guess uh, uh, this is you know how to like yeah managing managing that how did yeah how do you like manage that like, it, can you even manage that or is it just kind of, you just kind of have to let the community kind of just breathe and exist. You know what I mean? So for the discord, like it started by setting precedent and being there. And so the first year of the channel, I was in the discord every day. I was in the main channels that were active every day, setting an example, being like a director of the culture and then creating a moderation team, which could help um, maintain the discord atmosphere. So right. eventually we had a set of rules. We had like a mission statement that really represent kind of my values and the values of the discord, which are like, we're not going to talk about politics ever. Like that's a rule, which is like, like a lot of people are like, Oh, why, why would you, why would you say that? Why wouldn't you say like religion or anything else? Cause someone can make one comment about religion. And as long as it's not like a big issue, it's fine. But like with every politics, it just triggers people. And it's just not what this discord is for. It does. Um, yeah. That, and that's important. That is definitely important. You know, it, I, I, maybe you speak on this more, but as a, there's a time and a place for people to talk religion and politics. This discord, this chemistry community is not that atmosphere. Now, maybe, yes. maybe you want to do talk about that. Okay. So take it outside 
this discord yeah you know this I, discord I is that. a place that i'm cultivating and if you don't want to be a part of that community that's fine You're, you don't have to be but if you'd mm-hmm. like to be a part of the community you can try and understand what we're doing mm-hmm. and we're trying to prioritize self-reflection and learn in a direction that's productive and we're going to avoid saying things that are misleading or hurtful because that would be counterproductive right. and like most people are like that sounds good i want to be a part of that um and i'm not as present as i used to be there but it's not about me it's never been about me yeah right it's about the community yeah what i what i and what i appreciate about you as well is that like i mean it takes some i think people always envision like oh i'm gonna i'm gonna make it on youtube i'm gonna make a big youtube channel i'm gonna have a huge discord we're gonna get so many people involved it's like great aspirations but doing it is one is a whole different beast and like you said i mean Maybe maybe at first it was too much. You said it was like, what, four hours a day in the server? But you were there uh, doing it. It was recently that, it, like, the four hours per day in the server, it was mostly in DMs four hours per day, like, yeah. not even on the server. I, I can barely look at the server now because there's too much going on everywhere all the time. Mm. And I try and be pragmatic and work in ways that are actionable for me. Yeah. So if things aren't actionable, I'm not going to usually draw my attention to it unless someone's like, hey, this needs your attention now. Like, uh, occasionally people get banned, but very, very few people have had to be banned from the Discord. Fewer than 70, definitely fewer than 70, I think probably fewer than 60 even. And there was someone who had to be banned this week who is someone that works in my production and in a friend's production. But Mm. it's because he kept posting, uh, you know, syntheses of a drug, which is another policy that we have is like, don't post the synthesis of an illegal substance. Mm. And like, I already know that the FBI is in the Discord. I know that because there's two separate occasions which I've had to talk to the inner to talk to people from the FBI because of certain things that like oh my. people were posting about. Yeah. Like that's crazy. It's crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> what the, um, <laughs> the, I don't even know what to say to that. I, I didn't, I it's, it's, these are issues. That, okay, have you I'll ever you like imagined that you'd be having, you'd well, be I having, I don't want to No, I never imagined that it would be me, but, uh, I, I like, definitely don't think I should talk about it on here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here's fine. Here's the thing. The way people get caught, is the way people get caught is they're stupid and they talk about it and that applies to everything right um if you've read uh dostoevsky's crime and punishment Mm -hmm. what happens is the guy it's a self-report red is sus yeah that's all i got to say yeah (laughs) uh yeah it's uh i it some of the illegal substances they may have published methods to make them but you could just yeah don't don't like share that to the like it's a very don't delicate do, game. Don't copy like, it. And like, like there's a time and a place like showing an undergrad on a fume hood. That's yeah. the right place. Yeah. Like, or on a whiteboard in a class. <laughs> that's fine. You can have a poster in the hallway and that's fine. Yeah. But online, there's something called pose law, which is everything that could be an extreme view can be mistaken as an extreme view. Mm. Like you can't tell if it's parody or not. So like, don't say things that could be misunderstood. And like, you know, there has to be someone who's an outlier. And if you're the only one talking about drugs and you're talking about drugs every day, people go, hmm, this guy's thinking about drugs a lot. I wonder why. Right. Yeah, you definitely, because, uh, you, yeah, you cannot tell when people are being, or when something's like a parody or not. At least, at least, unless, unless you're like. Without tonal indicators. Right. Tonal indi- And, you know, if you have an Instagram or an extra, like, and you literally are, and it says in your description that this is a parody account. Like, no one's going to, people will always take that as literal um and so even I, still I they that. might even still they might even right? still like <laughs> even when people read the onion people still think it's serious like literally yes. <laughs> um but now all, all that's uh really insightful um i want to yeah definitely uh well another so you're managing you know you're managing the channel you know trying to trying to stay updated with the discord but as you mentioned i mean it, it, it's almost impossible it's it comes to a point where you just can't even you can't do it by yourself anymore. And you, you do have to be pragmatic for your own mental and physical health. Like you, you had to be, but, um, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, what, you know, what are you doing now? Right. So obviously you're still doing those things, but I mean like kind of the direction of the channel, but also, sure. You know, I don't know. I don't know how full time you are with, with YouTube though too. Yeah. So. Oh, YouTube, YouTube is now full time now. Let's that go. I'm done. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, so future directions, I'm planning on starting my own podcast relatively soon here. We're doing hey. some production work for Elsevier. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but they haven't told me I can't say that, so uh, I plead ignorance. Uh, if, That's fair. If there's if other they say, companies who like, want us to do some production work, we're like open to that. I feel like if they, 
unless they explicitly say you can't say that, then I feel like it's open game. Because I feel like if it's important enough to, to not say it, they would tell you that. You know what I mean? They're happy to put my name. Yeah, they're happy to put my name behind what they're doing. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like we're working on some outsourced work for other companies. Uh, that kind of stuff's fun because it gives new projects for the team aside from like, hey, let's make another tier list. Um, we have a whole team of producers or not producers, sorry, like writers and editors, people doing awesome stuff. They're awesome to work with and I love working with them because yeah. they share the vision that you and I do, which is like, let's do this and let's do this well and let's talk about chemistry. And like that passion is so, so important. Mm -hmm. um and that's what we do really well right that's why we're orators it's yeah like, right we're the we guys try to be the soapbox we, we try to be yeah we, well it's like you have to not get in your head too much right mm -hmm. it's like you are because you are yeah that's it um there's there's kind of no other reason i'm doing this other than like i want to be doing it and like i just want to see the voice you want to see in the world yeah like i just want to be i just want to i just want to see how people you know help people producer chemistry and like a, a friendly that's that's yeah you're giving always... yourself a second reason to have a conversation with them right and, and i that's one of the things we do is we give ourselves three or four ways to do stuff like if this fails what would i do instead right okay well what if that failed then this is another option and this is like coming up with three or four synthetic approaches but now we've come up with multiple reasons to have a podcast instead of like multiple reasons to produce a specific substrate right you know I hear that. Yeah. So, like, what scale do you work on? I'd be curious to hear that. Like, uh, when you're doing experiments, what, like, what I do? Yeah. Oh man, I mean, my some of my catalytic reactions are the the because I well, I mean, I do traditional metal catalysis, um, so palladium chemistry uh, mostly, uh, and I do well. The scales are somewhere anywhere between point two five millimole and one millimole. So okay, I don't know. Go, give it take. Chemistry. Yeah, it's. Yeah, I would say, I would say, tr how would I describe this? So, trying to make synthetically useful chemistry for med chemists, or trying to make uh, catalysts that are useful for med chem, basically, is what I do. Um, okay. And so that you know, what sort of ligand system? So I guess what I do specifically is I'm developing platinum oxidative addition complexes, and okay. the idea is that. Um, so if you wanted to do any sort of cross coupling, so Suzuki coupling, CN coupling, CS, CO, for MedChem, you might have a, you might need a very specific catalyst to do your substrates, right? The, yes, um, exactly. There are literally, literally hundreds of catalysts you could choose from for palladium. Um, do they plate I, those yet? Have, has their catalyst plates yet? I don't know because there I should be if there isn't. So if you're if you're in medchem and you have a library, please make plates of of every palladium ligand. Yeah, a complex. Just that sounds like something we need if that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, uh, that's a, that would be a great. That's actually yeah, a great idea. Just a, a well plate of all the different um, catalysts, mm -hmm. and that's just that's just I guess the catalyst too slash precursor. We didn't even talk about the ligands yet. So I mean, you can imagine there are true hundreds yeah. of combinations for. Um, selenium precursor slash ligand. Okay, so you have all those options, right? And maybe you need to find a certain med chemist has needs one of those to get their substrates to 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 couple. So instead of having to buy each and every catalyst plus ligand, you could take one palladium precursor and then a survey all the ligands, and that would be yeah. access to. That would be a more efficient way to to do optimization for your particular substrate. Because it is true for for whatever reason, some ligand slash platinum precursor works for certain substrates and, and it might not work for others. And it's not exactly clear why that is, but it's just the way it is. So what if you could have one universal platinum precatalyst that could uh, bind the philosopher's stone? Yeah. If you had one Played in precalus that can bind virtually any ligand, and you would you have generated. Well, the idea is that you would generate in situ the on cycle catalyst. So you would yep, buy. Yep. The idea is you would buy, um, specifically a palladate species. What I'm trying to make so it's a palladium dimer that doesn't really have a that doesn't have a phosphine or a like palladium one dimer. Not like that. It would be a um, 
you can imagine a oh, bridging a bromine. Bidentate ligand, which is okay. Okay. No, so it's a bridging bromine, and then you have, um, uh, what's the word? So you, yeah, you, it's a bridging bromine, and you have two palladiums, and then it's also surrounded okay. by a halogen and an aryl group, and that's the dimer. And you can imagine that if you had a strong donor ligand, like a phosphine or a, a carbene, you could break the dimer, and th in that case, you have generated a T-shaped palladium species, which is on cycle for many of these cross-coupling reactions. And that's the idea. Okay. That's the general idea. Um, and that's what I do. And right now, I'm surveying what I really, you know, what we're trying to do is showing that this that this complex can be super versatile. So you could do stilly. You know, stilly coupling, CN coupling, Carrollton species. Yeah, uh, yeah. I should say you could, you could, your nucleophile, or your, I guess you could say your transmetallation reagent can come from tin, silicon. Have you tried uh, uh, germanium? No, that's that is that is an interesting like showing back chemistry as well. Yeah, yeah. Shrana back. I actually wanted her to come on the podcast, but she. Uh... Yeah, you should. Uh, so if you can't get her, Thomas Scatlin, he was okay. one of her postdocs. So he worked on the desulfur defluorination with the nitrogen series. Okay. He's also a really good guy to talk to. Like he's like us. He's like us. Yeah. So, yeah. I uh the germanium chemistry is certainly interesting. And a lot of neat chemistry's come out recently where you could have like a germanium, silicon, and like boron on, on one arrow group. That's, and they'll yeah. be selectively for the germanium is quite that's neat. That's just neat. It's like neat. it's just that's also um, palladium chemistry too, if I'm not mistaken. It is, yeah. It's 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 catalyzed by palladium. Um, again, palladium does everything. So uh -huh. it's losing everything. Yeah, I like those ones because they're like the palladium one dimers, and they're fun to look at because they've got interesting symmetry. I yeah. don't know if they're like synthetically useful, but they're like aesthetically useful. Yeah, they are. Uh, so the the um, yeah the the I guess bridging I guess you could iodide or yeah. Bromine. I was to say I guess you could say the famous one is the the bridging iodine with uh, tributylphosphine. I think that's Shoanna Beck's. Uh, yes, kind of... that's right. Yeah, I know yeah, she does one I, of the ones that they use. I know she works a lot with that, but I don't remember if she like developed. Who knows? If she, like, it doesn't I don't matter. Know. It doesn't Who really matter. Who invented things don't matter. It's the chemistry. If it's good, it's good. Right. If it's not, it's not. And like anytime someone tries to talk about individuals, it's like it's only useful if it's like to t to tell you about all of the other chemistry that they do. Right. Um. Yeah. So, so anyway, that's what I do. Um. Trying awesome. to make a, if I had the one sense is trying to make a, uh, a universal palladium catalyst that is, you know, that can handle any, any cross coupling, honestly. Um, and you wouldn't have yeah, to I buy all the, the catalysts. The best thing you could do is do comparison studies with other palladium sources. So like, oh, if so I'm you're going to have yep. like a multi, oh, you're doing that. So like Tetricus. Uh, yep. So, yep. So that's, that's actually, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to put some out or I'm hoping Right now, right now, ACS I'm troubled. Well, I would love ACS catalysis. I, well, I think the impact, I think this would be like an easily like organic letters or ACS catalysis. But um, what I really, what I'm, what I'm having trouble with right now is reproducing the literature. So, and this, this, yeah. is, this, this is what happens. Like I'm trying to, uh, you know, I got to, you know, you got to purify all the starting materials. I got to make sure that the, because a lot of cross coupling cocktails contain bases. So I got to make sure that the, the bases are extremely pure. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, analyzing the, the NMR yields, or in some cases, you know, you gotta isolate them. Like the other day I had a substrate that just straight up just got lost in the column. I don't know what happened to it. I'm telling you, I'm yeah, telling you right now, happens. like sometimes, uh, sometimes it's like the shape do you use amorphous silica or spherical silica. Uh, I'm sorry. Are we asking or you're. You, oh yeah, it, like, it, like do you use if you use amorphous silica, there's a chance that like it's just gonna have just the right shape for a certain substrate. Mm -hmm. And the um, SIOHs can esterify with substrates, right? Mm. So if you've got something that can form like an ester derivative on silica, it can be like irreversible. And you'll also just yep. have a probability that some percentage of your molecules is just going to fit some of the silica perfectly, like lock and key. Yep. Um that you Yeah, I, say, I think the latter. Advice, Try deactivating your silica. So, like, yeah. do like triethylamine. I don't know if you know about that, but if I don't you do know like about that. Point point one percent triethylamine. You can also pack your Ooh. column with it. No, I actually I did know about that. I should have I should have done. I forgot about that that uh, that the hack of activating or 
Would it be deactivating? deactivating? Yeah, deactivating it, silica. It, they say deactivating. The main thing is if the OHs are already depronated, mm -hmm. it wouldn't esterify under acidic conditions. Yeah. Um, another thing you can do is if you need to like pull your substrate off, you can always do like a methanol DCM wash, like ten percent yep. methanol DCM. There's like there's a lot of those kinds of things. It was one of those. It was just like it was one of those days though where I literally spent. I I'd spent multiple hours on this column, multiple volumes of solvent on this column, and I just couldn't oh, yeah. get it off. And I just, it was at the end of the day, and I said, "Fuck it, I'm done with this. I can't do this anymore. Like I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this." And because of my ignorance and frustration, I didn't do a methanol wash. It probably would work. And also, I should have done the pyridine uh, deactivation. Oh, these yeah, are all skills. Everyone. Listen, these are all skills I'm learning now. All right, so yeah, you're you're a grad student, so this is yeah. this is exactly how you learn it. This is the troubleshooting that we just all got to go through. Um, but yeah, that's an important one. I I, for, I forgot about the pyridine trick because um, I do remember specifically my advisor, uh, Brad Caro, um, telling me about that. That you know, sometimes you just have those kind of substrates, just you know to deactivate your um, column with some pyridine. I, I remember that specifically, but I just didn't do it do this you know time. About, do you know about not Voodoo X? I do not know. Okay. Okay. So this is one of the best resources for you as a current grad student. If you go to not Voodoo X, it's from the university of Rochester and they have tips and tricks. So they've got like awesome chromatography advice. They've got awesome workup conditions. If you're ever doing like uh, lithium aluminum hydride stuff, mm -hmm. like there's the Pfizer workup, um, how to quench dye ball, like lots of very useful things. Let me, I'm going to, what's this called again? I'm going to look this up now and so I can not save it. Voodoo X. Not Voodoo. Not yeah, it comes X. out, not Voodoo Chemistry. <laughs> it's really good. Um, oh, yeah, there it yeah, is. That's probably one of the best online resources for chemistry stuff. I'm going to come back to this. student, wet lab. Yeah. Then there's like a buy it versus resource. prepare buy it versus prepare it is another one on there um like you can see what a bunch of people have voted on like should you buy it or should you make it and that's like finally we have like some way to talk to each other <laughs> other chemistry strangers out there is that on here wait hang on let me see yeah, oh yeah here's chromatography is... oh magic formulas or what would you um or where, where is it's it it's like uh you'll rookie? you'll have to explore it later yeah okay there's a lot of rookie mistakes later. too like uh it's like have you ever had this happen and it's like how similar are we we're really similar we just don't know that because we're all siloed dude i did and not, not know everybody goes to conferences i did not know this resource existed holy crap not video x yeah. put it in the rochester thank god for university of rochester wow yeah okay and now you got people you could potentially invite for your next episode there too, you go whoever is managing this there we go. Um, when when are we when are we bringing back five important organic papers, dude? I need I need that that video again. Uh, I, I okay. love that. So My favorite series. We're making a change. We're making a change. It used to be all new papers, but we're changing to just good papers. Hey. So like, we have the next video that's coming up. It should be ready late late April. Is uh, five important papers in radical chemistry, and we're just going to talk about some contemporary radical strategies that you might not have known about but are really important and the benefit here is if you look at a lot of new papers it's really 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 hard to find good new papers mm -hmm. but if you're just looking for good papers like good papers based on reviews and stuff then oh that's way better because if i give you five reviews that'll give you starting points for like this is how to actually do modern radical chemistry that's mm -hmm. what you want that's actually more what you want than you even knew what you wanted because every time i've talked to a synthetic chemist their answers uh, like when I asked, like, oh, like, what's your favorite series on the channel? It's always important papers. And to me, important papers is still so bad compared to where I would like it to be. Um, mm. So it's like, oh, man, I really need to keep doing this. So it's my passion project that we're keeping alive. Yeah. And, um, so later this month. I'm excited. I'm excited for that. For that then. Um, I also I, I've been noticing, I guess, through social media. Are you doing like chemistry in your own home? Like what, you have all this lab equipment. Like what, what's going on here? Yeah, oh. I I have a uh, I have up there. There's like a, a VOC detector. There's also like a fine particulate matter. I'm not doing a ton of synthesis at the moment. Right now, I'm mostly yeah. doing plant stuff. Okay. But uh, yeah, if I'm doing anything like a distillation, I have like a wind tunnel that I I set up. But I'm not doing a ton of chemistry at the moment. This okay. is just like in the meantime to like purify some ether, just because you need ether for some stuff. Yeah. Like, like I don't know. Like the more you do lab work, the more you realize there's a couple things you need occasionally from lab work for other reasons like to remove specific uh sharpie whatever mm, yeah that's fair 
All right. Well, Joey, I want to thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. Yeah, it, it was, was a pleasure speaking such a you. pleasure chatting with you and uh, good banter, good uh, good energy. Um, and I just I think that the I think the future of chemistry is in good hands. Um, I hope so. I I I think it's I I think it's moving in the right direction, and that's all we can really do. You know, we're yep. we're trying to be passionate. We're trying to put. I what I'm what I'm noticing is that when I've talked to, you know, other graduate students slash people that recently graduated, the general feeling is we really want to get out of the academic mold where, yes, people listen. I'm not I'm not saying this is everything, but the general feeling is that. There's a lot of gatekeeping. There's a lot of politics that go into academia, and it, that is just hard, so hard to articulate to people that are not inside this this field or within this yes. area. Um, and we're trying to shift the tide. That's what I'll that's yes. what I'll say. Um, we're close opinions, to the tipping point. Uh, opinions are our own. Um, so, but like we said, if you yeah, disagree with opinion- it. If I said anything, it doesn't necessarily represent what Aiden thinks, especially since he's still a grad student. Yeah, and that's part of the game too. It's like I, I, there's some things I, I really want. Like there's some things I wouldn't that have said a say. year ago that I will say now. Yeah, and that, <laughs> that's when I talked to you know when I talked to the basically doctors. I talked to Nina and uh, Anna, who also recently graduated, but they have their own podcast now that they're trying to start up. It's kind of the same Good. thing. It's it's the same thing. It's like we're trying. They why while, while you're in it. It's hard to say stuff. You got to hold your tongue a bit, but when you get out, um, you can kind of have a it's little like, bit more. It's uh, like you're the, you're one of the rocks of chemistry, and the rocks are starting to cry out because mm. it's like we we are seeing that we need to be the change we want in the world, and that's good. Yeah, that's, that's good. any any. It's not going to get worse by doing this, right? Right. Um, and like we said, listen, my DMs are open for anyone that has a complaint. I will hear you out. Um, uh, but. We're we're gonna t- continue doing our own thing, and guess what? The tide's moving, and this is gonna be a huge tide. So, and if people start getting taken down, you can bet your ass I'm gonna cover it, because <laughs> like that is like exactly targeting the people who are the problem. Right? right. So like we're gonna be Prometheus. We're gonna steal fire from the gods, and we're gonna find some real philosopher stones out there. Mm-hmm. Just you wait. Hey, let's go. Um, how can uh you know how can uh people. Oh, any any uh, lasting advice? Any uh, how can people again uh, get in touch with you? What can people watch? Oh, like just yeah. the most important thing you can do is actually share good videos with people. Like if you have a colleague that you think would really benefit from seeing a video, please share it. Yeah. The algorithms learn from that. Like if you share things to certain types of people, they learn faster. Um, if like, but this also goes beyond chemistry. Just like if you have someone that you want to send a video to, do it. Take the leap of faith and send it to them. Yeah, because nobody does that, and you're gonna give them a better feed than any algorithm can. Mm. So please do share this, and make sure you subscribe to this podcast. Yes, yes. Otherwise, you're gonna be under my scope. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate, it. I appreciate it, Joey. Appreciate your time for the viewers. Thank you for you know listening in again. Again, if you are if you aren't already following that chemist's YouTube channel, go ahead. It's great content. But uh, let's you know. Hopefully, we do this again soon. Maybe in a few months, we'll a few months we'll we'll check back in. Um, yeah, and, and maybe see. you can be a guest on my podcast. Hey, so I'd love some more about your palladium chemistry. Hey, I would love to do that. I would love I'd love to to do that. So, but with that, we'll we'll see you on the next episode. Alrighty.